Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Skoll. How uh, scary is it to follow these two wonderful presentations? Uh, I thought I'd lower the tone a bit because I feel a bit sort of uh, short of air. I, I, last, last November, I had to go and give a speech in a place called Telford. For those of you who are foreign, it's sort of that way, a long way. Uh, and their idea of regional development was to build an absolutely monstrous conference center which would hold just about the entire population of Telford. And for all of you who know about public speaking, you all know you need a couple of minutes just to get into the zone, you know, to feel those words coming up, you know, to get ready. And I arrived late because they, along with the conference center, had built one of the most complicated one-way road systems you've ever seen. <laughs> so I arrived late and I knocked on the door of the stage door and they opened the stage door and there's this guy in a silver lame jacket. And he said, mate, am I pleased to see you? I wish the feeling had been mutual. <laughs> and I, I, I uh, anyway, I waited for a while. And this guy scuttled up these wooden stairs, a bit like that. And he said, wait a minute. He opens these velvet curtains. And the next thing I hear is, I want to hear a big hand for Mr. Tim Smith. And on the T of Smith, the loudest disco music you've ever heard started. <laughs> and the whole bloody place was just rumbling like that. Right. And he scuttled down again. He said, you're on, mate. And I, I don't know whether you're whether this has ever happened to you. I walked up the stairs, I parted the curtains, and I went blank. I mean, utterly blank. I mean, so blank, there was not a single word I could think of. So I thought, hold the stage, Tim. Look as if you know what you're doing. So I strolled slowly to the middle of the stage and then walked towards the front of the stage. Still nothing, absolutely nothing. I got to the point where my toes were on the edge of the orchestra pit. I had nowhere left to go. To buy myself the extra few seconds, I leant forward until it was about to be the point of no return. And I looked at the audience in terror, and I screamed at the top of my voice, you're all going to die! <laughs> well, anyway. There was 4,000 people there, right? And they all put their hands on the back of the, their chairs and started to sit down. I thought, God, what I say next? I then, for those of you who do some public speaking, great tip coming up, right? I then realized how to buy time. I said, if you or you, <laughs> or, so I kept pointing, right? I kept pointing, and then it, I then said, if you truly feared me, if you really believed you were gonna die on April the 23rd, 2023, how many of you would still wanna work for this damn company tomorrow? Absolute silence. <laughs> anyway, the speech got a bit better after that, and <laughs> they, they, I, 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 I got, but I was actually trying to point, I, I, I'm very frightened of death, and why it was actually quite helpful, and I wove it into the speech, was that we all seem to think that death is optional. So we piss around, wasting our lives away, dreaming of adventures, being in bars, talking about what we're gonna do next week and the week after, but we never do it, right? We never do it. So you need to actually have the fire of actually being able to imagine the amount of birthdays between now and your death, and suddenly you think, Christ, when am I going to go to the Antarctic? When am I gonna do that? When am I gonna do that? And suddenly you're fired up. So that was the first, no, that's the second really crap speech I've made. <laughs> but I, I, oh, the, the, I ought to tell you the epilogue to this speech, right? The next day, I get back to Eden, and the scale of the disaster became apparent. Because at 4 o'clock in the morning, there's this email from the chief executive of the company I'd addressed. And he says, I've just been speaking to my wife, um, and I've decided to leave the company. No, but... But the truth is, so many people piss their lives up against the wall because they're too scared to take risks. The sort of people they are that piss their lives up against the wall use words like this, center of excellence. <laughs> out, out of the box. <laughs> Joined up thinking. Leading edge, bleeding edge, cutting edge, which is when I suppose you get too close to that bleeding edge. <laughs> and then, there is thinking the unthinkable. How cool is that? Have you ever realized in life that the people who use that language are in inverse relation to the time they use it? Have you also realized that every part of the world is unique? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> language is everything. The first crap speech I made, I'd restored a garden called the Lost Gardens of Heligan, and it had been on press and the telly and everything else, and it was very successful. It had become the most visited garden in Britain, actually by accident, because the television documentary had forgotten to mention we weren't open to the public. So these people just kept turning up, and eventually we, <laughs> eventually we, we, we ripped a toilet out of the port and started to charge people to come in, and we were still working, so they would say, what's happening here? And you say, no idea, here's a machete, why don't you go? <laughs> so for budding social entrepreneurs, a great social model, 
get people to pay to come in and then do the work for you, which is <laughs> a, a really good one. Anyway, I was invited to talk to the Historic Houses Association, don't you know? You know the sort of corduroy trousers, the tweed jacket with the leather patches and all owning stately homes? Mostly called Nigel, that sort of thing. <laughs> and I went up, and I went up. I, 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 went, I went, went up and I managed to alienate. The, I was, the, the, the gist of the speech was how to open your stately homes and gardens to the general public. And they were hoping for some insights. And I alienated the entire audience in the first sentence because I got up and I said, look, if you don't feel like getting drunk in it, you don't feel inspired to dream in it, and you don't desire to make love in it, for fuck's sake, tarmac it. <laughs> and it went down really. But the point I was actually trying to make is a serious one. Okay, in Britain, if a 1920s car were to go through that wall right now, other than the regrettable loss of life over here, <laughs> right? Everybody else would say, beautiful old car. <laughs> The old, uh, old stuff in Britain is always held up as if the world smelt of baking bread all the time. But in fact, most of the people in this room would have been put on a stake. You know that. The future is a beautiful and exciting place. And I want to just discuss it in the little bit of time I've got. I run my life in a very odd way. I had a traumatic experience in 1981. I was driving, being driven along the Champs-Élysées in a chauffeur-driven limousine. I was staying in the Plaza Athenée hotel and I was going to the Tour d'Argent to get a gold and a platinum record. The record at number one was the biggest selling record in French history. The record at number two that was going to knock it off the number one spot, shame, I'd written it too. Okay, we're driving and I suddenly burst into tears. Uncontrollable tears. I never got to the award ceremony, I went back to the hotel and I decided to give up the music industry because something really weird had happened. You know when you imagine what you want, it's a bit like Aruna's film, when you imagine what you want, material things, the adulation of others and the rest of it, it is extraordinary how much it feels like sand going through your fingers. Because when you get there, suddenly your imagining of it is that you are surrounded by the people you love. But when you see that you're nothing more than a product and you're a cog in a machine, it tastes very dry indeed. Dorothy Parker, the American writer, once famously described it. She said, the problem with getting there is that when you get there, there's no there there. And I think most of us understand what that means, that hollow inside us. I decided to change my life, and I decided to do something very radical. For those of you, any of you read Luke Reinhardt's The Dice Man? If you haven't, you should. It's about a guy who wants to make decisions based on decisions against a dice number. And I decided that I was going to just follow my instincts. Whatever my instincts told me to do, I would do. So I went to Cornwall and I bought a farmhouse and I was going to build a recording studio to do film music and I was going to do something else. Someone gave me a pig. The pig was great, we became friends and I found another pig for it because he was very lonely. They bred and I wanted to start a rare breed park and this rare breed park led me to some land which I wanted to buy to do the rare breed park. The guy who owned the land said you can't have that land but I've just inherited an estate next door to this land um, which is completely overgrown. It's been overgrown for 70 years. Would you like to see it? And we went in the following day with machetes. 45 minutes later, I'd fallen in love with this place. I couldn't tell you the difference between a rhododendron and a sycamore, but I decided I was going to restore it and open it to the public, and it eventually did get open to the public. I learned a big lesson that changed my future in the middle of that, that I was not as funny to other people's children as I was to my own, because, of course, the thing about your own children is they're expecting Christmas presents and birthday presents, but, and you feed them, but other people's children have no such duty of laughter. <laughs> and I, I had three loads of school children to entertain, the most stressful thing in my entire life, until I hit on the secret of communication by telling them about the poisons that would burn through your stomach lining and make you die a painful death. <laughs> At which point, respect, and I could tell them anything. I understood the power of story, and I understood that by transforming this garden and telling stories, ordinary stories, about the ordinary men and women who made this garden, a whole bunch of people who didn't normally go to gardens started to come. Latin was banned. We just told anecdotes. And in the middle of it, I had this desire to build this fantastic place in a clay pit, because I wanted to re regenerate the middle of Cornwall uh, with a gang of people. And I started talking about it, and people started leaving their jobs. And at a certain point, I had 100 people had given up their jobs and were helping me develop this idea called the Eden Project. And what happened next was very weird. I lead my life by three rules. Number one is, 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 is the telling of future truths, which is, other people call it lying. Um, <laughs> but what it means is that you, you, create, you create the fuel of change by saying something so outrageous in your ambitions amongst people you respect so much that not to do it will shame you. Therefore, you end up doing it. It began when I told a beautiful blonde concert pianist that I was a diving instructor when I was 19. 
And the, 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 most, the most outrageous example of it was in 1997 when we had applied for a grant from the Millennium Commission um, for 37 and a half million pounds and I bought this brand new fax machine and the very first fax that came out of it was the decision from the Millennium Commission, who are part of the lottery for those of you who come from which had divided all the projects in Britain into grade A, grade B, grade C. Grade A was you got the money, grade B a bit more work and you'll get the money, grade C never darken our door again. <laughs> the Eden project was grade C. Well what do you do? You've got a hundred people who've given up their lives to come and work with you to build on this fantastic thing. What would you do? What would you do? Do you just say, oh, really disappointing news, guys? Well, you may think this is unethical, but I called a news conference. And ITV and Sky and the BBC came, and all the national newspapers, and I thanked the Millennium Commission for their bold decision. <laughs> and, uh, but, 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 you know, the bizarre thing was, three months later, the Millennium Commission was convinced that's what it had said. <laughs> that was really odd. But what I want to say to you who are considering becoming, <laughs> what I want to say to all of you who are considering becoming entrepreneurs, a load of people have stolen the language of entrepreneurship, but the real secret of being an entrepreneur is to realize that the amount of energy you give up in fear at the risks of being one, if you actually did it, the energy that you were wasting on the fear and then didn't do it, when you then do it, the actual risk has been minimized massively because your body language just changes. Once you've gone to the top high diving board and you know there's a risk of your underpants coming off when you get in the water, when you've already gone, you actually want to do a swallow dive, don't you? So you don't actually have a belly flop because that's even worse because if you do a belly flop, you have to make sure it was funny and it actually hurts. <laughs> so entrepreneurship is actually about taking big risks at exactly the right time because something happens to your body language and I cannot tell you if you don't do it I cannot tell you why success comes to people who take risks, but it's something about the look in your eye that you know that you're burning your bridges behind you, and it somehow gives you a swagger of intent that convinces people. The second rule I have is last man standing, which holds that if you have a certain amount of charm and you don't go away, people will eventually pay you large sums of money to do so. <laughs> um, and that... that is, that has been one of the touchstones of my life. The, the third thing, the third thing I do, which is weird, but try it on. Everybody talks about their effing comfort zones, don't they? And how interesting it would be to meet nice other people, okay? And then what they do, they accept all the usual invitations. I have policed myself to do the most radical thing. I accept every third invitation unless it clashes with a family commitment. How many people here have been forced to judge an orchid show? with psychopathic orchid growers. <laughs> How many, you know, I've had to open an old people's home. I've had to do the weirdest shit. But at each one, I have met somebody who's transformed my life. Every single weird thing I've done in that way, something has come out of it. 1997, I went to give a talk to 50 people and a dog in a shed in Taunton. My PA threatened resignation because it was so irresponsible. I said, I have to go, it's the third invitation. I came back, right, I came back. And there were indeed 50 people and a dog. And anyway, three months later, in Plymouth, there's a, the European Commission is a meeting to decide how money is going to be distributed around the Southwest. Cornwall isn't going to get any money. The Eden Project is going to get no money. And suddenly, this old bearded guy gets up and he says, my name's Humphrey Templey. I am chairman of Somerset County Council. And to my amazement, three months ago, I went to a talk in a shed in Taunton. <laughs> and this man, Smith, was there. And he's convinced me that he has the wider Southwest as his attention span, not just the narrow confines of Cornwall. So we in Somerset will drop two of our projects so the Eden Project may go ahead. That one talk was worth 12.7 million pounds. <laughs> no, but it happens time after time after time. Putting yourself at risk isn't risk at all. It is opening up wonderful possibilities. I have one other rule which I feel I can share because we're amongst friends, but I never write about it. It is kill negative people. You must <laughs> kill. No. Yep. You know what? You know why? Because negative people don't have dreams and they don't want you to have them either. <laughs> That's why they must crush them underfoot like an old fag butt. Get rid of them.
because of course everybody who has a dream is insecure inside. So someone like a drip of water, like a Chinese water torture, you're not going to go ahead, are you, if people are around you? I do not let negative people get anywhere near me at work. Nowhere near me. Anyway, we opened the Eden Project um, in uh, 1990. Well, we started work in 1998. We opened in fully in 2001, or St. Patrick's Day. We've had 12 million visitors since we did that. And if you were to ask me why we did it, we did it because it was a political thing. I was fed up with people in pinstripe suits thinking that people who believed in good stuff couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if people like us actually built the most high-tech, brilliant, sexy, iconic-looking thing the world had ever seen so they could no longer reject us and marginalize us? That's the way you get marginalized, because they think, oh, it's so sweet, so alternative, those chaps with their views. <laughs> and that's my hatred of this social enterprise movement. I loathe it. And you're all here because it's about social enterprise. Pamela's looking concerned. Don't worry. <laughs> What I loathe is that library hush you get from politicians, as if they're talking about the unfortunates and giving them nice jobs. You know, social enterprises for people who couldn't get proper jobs, really. The slightly befuddled and vague, okay? I think the big challenge is to stop politicians getting anywhere near social enterprise, because in my, in my book, we should be building huge social enterprises. I would consider perhaps the water industry would be a good start. Perhaps the railways might be another one. Electrics might be another one, and so on. Didn't you think? Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Yo! But what we need, if you talk about it in a library hush, a lot of people will go and join those companies like JP Morgan and um, <laughs> Goldman Sachs and stuff, and we want those smart people not to waste their lives doing that stuff, because all those people are going to be sad gits when they're 60, and we know it. <laughs> Whereas if they did really good stuff, which actually used those talents to give it back to the people, they would actually feel fulfilled and contented. And we all know that, don't we? So we need to encourage all those bright, smart, young things to actually realize that social enterprise is a dynamic new form. It's probably the most exciting form of corporate development that's happened over the last 300 years. And it doesn't mean you have to do it and always remain poor as a church mice. As, mice, as far as I'm concerned, become a millionaire being a social entrepreneur. Be one. If everybody else has done wacko good, you get your, your cut. It's just a question of proportion. You don't have to wear a hair shirt. It's okay to like a better quality of wine. You don't have to pretend and lie about who you are. Just give back more. That's all it's about. If you can get to that point, you're in a really good place. So we, bu we built Eden because we wanted to take the most derelict place on Earth and create life in it and do as I described to you before. And we made 90,000 tons of our own soil. It's never been done before, and that technology is now being used all over the world to remediate mines. The second thing I wanted to do is to show how smart human beings are, because we forget that. We work in such silos that we don't have the chance to actually watch other people working. It is exhilarating to see how clever people are. If you relax out of yourself and say, wow, they're smart. When you see a mile of foundations being laid on gloopy clay with only 10 meter, 10 meter length between each bit, and you know it's allowed to move by 20 millimeters at the end of it, and it moves by eight, you think, whoa, we can do stuff on this planet. We're really smart. The third thing is, I wanted to see whether we could do a social experiment in capitalism. We, my, my chairman of trustees said something to me. He said, we got to 480 staff, and he said, Tim, you can no longer run this organization like a gang leader. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, he said, you've got to become corporate. And I said, how do you do that then? And he said, because I've never worked for anybody else, you see. And then he said, he said, damn it, man, you haven't even got any KPIs for anybody. And I said, well, what are they? <laughs> and he described it, and I said, I really, we have almost fell out. Because I said, surely if you know what you're doing when you employ people, you don't have to give them childish tick boxes of what they've got to do in a year. They know what to do. And he then looked at me and said very seriously, he said, Tim, if you don't make this more corporate, one of us is going to have to go. And I didn't understand the hint either, so I said, Ronnie, I'd be very sorry to see you leave. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, I got two bottles of very fine wine, and I went home for the weekend, and I wrote a management manual for the Eden Project, and it comprised about one side of A4. And it, they were rules called the monkey business. And the monkey business is actually about my philosophy of how you should be organizing stuff. So rule number one is you've got to say hello to, you've got to say good morning to 20 people before you're allowed to start work. It's not religious, it's not like some kind of weird religion, it's just to get me to community. 
Rule number two is you've got to read two books that everybody that knows you would say well, you're completely outside of your sphere of interest and review them for your colleagues. Rules number three, four, and five, you've got to go and see one movie, one theater bit, one, uh, 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 one big concert, same rule as number two. Rule number six, you've got to make a speech about why you still feel inspired to work for the Eden Project. If you can't do it, you have to resign. I find it concentrates the mind. Rule number seven, rule number seven is you've got to prepare a meal for the 40 people who make it worth coming to work. Uh, we've shrunk that a little bit on the grounds of some health and safety issues with some of my colleagues who are just appalling cooks. Um, but but the, anybody who thinks the breaking of bread is about eating is an idiot. Every single major decision we've taken at Eden, everything has been taken at night, working by wine light. Because, no, no, you see, an awful lot of people get it wrong. They go to work when the sun is up. So they take work person to work. If you work when the sun has gone down, you allow yourself to bring complete person, which means that all your life experience is now contributing to the thinking rather than just the, your so-called profession, yeah? Rule number eight you'll think is awful. Um, I know you'll think this is awful, and this is the point you boo me off stage is you have to conduct one act of guerrilla goodwill a year. You've got to do something unspeakably nice to somebody who will never know you did it, who you don't know. And actually, everybody thought it was a bit too touchy-feely for the Brits, but actually, we really enjoy doing it. It's great. Imagine what a country this would be if we all did that. And the last thing is, all of my team have to play samba drums. I've spent, <laughs> I have spent a fortune on drums, really. Yeah, the big surdus, boom, 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 kebasa, timbales, rak, 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 but there's a reason for it. Would you agree with me if I said to you that almost every child you've ever met that was fortunately born between the age of two and six naturally likes to sing and dance? Have you ever seen the British dancing? <laughs> what happens? It looks like there's a nervous disease going on. Yeah? And I find that really an interesting question. So I wanted everybody to learn how to do something that would make, put them in the, in the public limelight. So anyway. Um, we get these 10 drum captains, they take 45 people each, they go and do their little lips, lips and after, on the second day they all get together and the Sudu guys start, boom, 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 and they're stiff, abs, you can see the veins, they're like this. Right? And they're, and they're, anyway, by the time you get to the kibasas, the old Sudu guys, they're going, ooh, funky. <laughs> yeah? As they realize it's more difficult to go out of time than to stay in time. Right? By the time you get to the last rhythm, you see 470 quivering English people. They can't wait for the last rhythm to come in. And then it comes in and they go, oh, crackers. They go like March hares, they do, all over the place, jumping about and singing. They even go across the rhythm, you know, that's very, very groovy. And um, anyway, we get together at the end of it, and I say, why do you think we did that? Why do you think we did that? This isn't actually about hippie shit at all. Most of us, most of us have a little grain of self-hatred because we know that as a species we should add up to more, don't we? We know that. And yet we're destined to always disappoint and we hate that disappointment. And what that does is it gets like all these people doing something that they couldn't have done on their own and it feels huge. The, air st the hair stands up on the back of your neck. It's so exciting. That's why we do the other two things. I should finish, shouldn't I? But the other two things I just got to finish with, we make all our senior teams spend 12 days on the front line. Don't ever let a boss think they're too smart because it will destroy your organization. Because when you realize what upsets people mostly, you discover it's not about pay, it's about how they're listened to and what's going on. And the other thing we do, which is absolutely mad, don't listen to this, because business schools won't like this. What you've got to do if you're going to run a really successful organization, at the moment that you are as busy as busy can be, and every, every sinew of your organization is flexed, so the senior people can't do any more, do a fucking huge project. <laughs> you know why? You know why? Because... Because locked in any organization are a bunch of geniuses who never got letters after their names. And by doing a big project, you yourself cannot do it. Like we did Live 8 at Eden, right? In 17 days, we did Africa Calling. We raised a million pounds. We had to organize 120 musicians to come from Africa at a time of high terrorism alert. We had to deal with over 200 film companies. And none of it was done by a single senior person in my organization. It was all done by juniors who just rose to the top like cream. Time, she says. So, thank you.